Okay, are we coming through nice and clearly? A little bit of an echo there, metallic echo. Okay, so if I talk quietly, you can hear me at the back. It's a little bit ringing if I go loud. If I go very loud, it echoes a little bit. But sounding okay at the back? Okay, I think we shall begin. Um, welcome again, nice to see people again. Um, Today we have uh, another chapter, three chapters actually, so very similar to last week, basically the same, uh, and we have a brand new postcard. So if you haven't seen these yet, there's a new postcard at the desk here, which you can buy. Uh, again, illustrated and painted by my sister, who's in London at the moment, um, but she will actually be here in two weeks' time. So if you want, you can bring your postcards and she can sign them as well. Um, the, you may have noticed, uh, if you did go to get a postcard or if you get, went to buy a ticket, um, we're trying a new system where we have QR codes. So if people were trying that, I hope they worked. Um, is that okay? Did it work for people? Hopefully it does. It makes things a little simpler. Um, so that should be quite easy. The QR codes are both there at the table. All right, let us begin. And we will begin with chapter four. We left off last week with Bilbo, the dwarves, and Gandalf having narrowly escaped an encounter with three trolls. And this was, of course, after they had set off on their mission to the Lonely Mountain to go and rescue their treasure from a dragon that stole it many years before. And after they met with the trolls and managed to outsmart the trolls, thanks to Gandalf, uh, they also managed to raid the troll's cave, uh, and they managed to find a couple of swords, um, one for Gandalf, one for Thorin, and also a little sword for Bilbo as well. Uh, so, that's where we left off. Chapter 4. We've got a little bit of ringing feedback there. Is that a little bit distracting for people listening? It's a little bit distracting. I'll keep talking so you guys can just fix it. Is that, is that good? Is that better? A little bit more. It's a problem with technology. I'll keep talking. I'll keep talking. Sound, sounds a bit better. That sounds better. That sounds a lot better. All right. That's good. We'll begin. Thank you, guys. Chapter four, over hill and under hill. There were many paths that led up into those mountains, and many passes over them. But most of the paths were cheats and deceptions, and led nowhere or to bad ends. And most of the passes were infested by evil things and dreadful dangers. The dwarves and the hobbit, helped by the wise advice of Elrond and the knowledge and memory of Gandalf, took the right road to the right pass. Long days after they had climbed out of the valley and left the last homely house miles behind, they were still going up and up and up. It was a hard path and a dangerous path, a crooked way and a lonely and a long. Now they could look back over the lands they had left, laid out behind them far below. Far, far away in the west, where things were blue and faint, Bilbo knew there lay his own country, of safe and comfortable things, and his little hobbit hole. He shivered. It was getting bitter cold up here, and the wind came shrill among the rocks. Boulders, too, at times came galloping down the mountainsides, let loose by midday sun upon the snow, and passed among them, which was lucky, or over their heads, which was alarming. The nights were comfortless and chill, and they did not dare to sing or talk too loud, for the echoes were uncanny and the silence seemed to dislike being broken, except by the noise of water and the wail of wind and the crack of stone. The summer is getting on down below, thought Bilbo, and haymaking is going on and picnics. They'll be harvesting and blackberrying before we even begin to go down the other side at this rate. And the others were thinking equally gloomy thoughts. Although, when they had said goodbye to Elrond, in the high hope of a midsummer morning, they had spoken gaily of the passage of the mountains and the riding swift across the lands beyond. 
They had thought of coming to the do secret door in the lonely mountain, perhaps that very next last moon of autumn. And perhaps it will be Durin's day, they had said. Only Gandalf had shaken his head and said nothing. Dwarves had not passed that way for many years, but Gandalf had, and he knew how evil and danger had grown and thriven in the wild, since the dragons had driven men from the lands, and the goblins had spread in secret after the Battle of the Mines of Moria. Even the good plans of wise wizards like Gandalf and of good friends like Elrond go astray sometimes when you are off on dangerous adventures over the edge of the wild. And Gandalf was a wise enough wizard to know it. He knew that something unexpected might happen and he hardly dared to hope they would pass without fearful adventure over those great tall mountains with lonely peaks and valleys where no king ruled. They did not. All was well until one day they met a thunderstorm, more than a thunderstorm, a thunder battle. You know how terrific a really big thunderstorm can be down in the land and in a river valley, especially at times when two great thunderstorms meet and clash. More terrible still are thunder and lightning in the mountains at night when storms come up from east and west and make war. The lightning splinters on the peaks and rocks shiver and great crashes split the air and go rolling and tumbling into every cave and hollow and the darkness is filled with overwhelming noise and sudden light. Bilbo had never seen or imagined anything of the kind. They were high up in a narrow place with a dreadful fall into a dim valley at one side of them. There they were sheltering, under a hanging rock for the night, and he lay beneath a blanket and shook from head to toe. When he peeped out in the lightning flashes, he saw that across the valley the stone giants were out and were hurling rocks at one another for a game, and catching them and tossing them down into the darkness where they smashed among the trees far below or splintered into little bits with a bang. Then came a wind and a rain, and the wind whipped the rain and the hail about in every direction, so that an overhanging rock was no protection at all. Soon they were getting drenched, and their ponies were standing with their heads down and their tails between their legs, and some of them were whinnying with fright. They could hear the giants guffawing and shouting all over the mountainsides. This won't do at all, said Thorin. If we don't get blown off or drowned or struck by lightning, we shall be picked up by some giant and kicked sky high for a football. Well, if you know of anywhere better, take us there, said Gandalf, who was feeling very grumpy and was far from happy about the giants himself. The end of their argument was that they sent Feely and Keeley to look for better shelter. They had very sharp eyes, and being the youngest of the dwarves by some 50 years, they usually got these sorts of jobs when everybody could see that it was absolutely no use sending Bilbo. There is nothing like looking if you want to find something, or so Thorin is said to the young dwarves. You certainly usually find something if you look, but it is not always quite the something you are after. And so it proved on this occasion. Soon, Feely and Keeley came crawling back, holding on to the rocks in the wind. We have found a dry cave, they said, not far around the next corner and ponies and all could get inside. Have you thoroughly explored it? said the wizard, who knew that caves up in the mountains were seldom unoccupied. Yes, yes, they said, though everybody knew they could not have been long about it. They had come back too quick. It isn't all that big, and it does not go far back. That, of course, is the dangerous part about caves. You don't know how far they go back sometimes, or where a passage behind might lead to or what is waiting for you inside. But now Feely and Keeley's news seemed good enough, so they all got up and prepared to move. The wind was howling and the thunder still growling, and they had a business getting themselves and their ponies along. Still, it was not very far to go, and before long, they came to a big rock standing out into the path. If you stepped behind, you found a low arch in the side of the mountain. There was just room to get the ponies through with a squeeze when they had been unpacked and unsaddled. As they passed under the arch, it was good to hear the wind and the rain outside instead of all about them, and to feel safe from the giants and their, and their rocks. 
but the wizard was taking no risks. He lit up his wand, as he did that day in Bilbo's dining room that seemed so long ago, if you remember. And by its light, they explored the cave from end to end. It seemed quite a fair size, but not too large and mysterious. It had a dry floor and some comfortable nooks. At one end, there was room for the ponies, and there they stood, mighty glad of the change, steaming and champing in their nosebags. Oyen and Gloyen wanted to light a fire at the door to dry their clothes, but Gandalf would not hear of it. So they spread out their wet things on the floor and got dry ones out of their bundles. Then they made their blankets comfortable, got out their pipes and blew smoke rings, which Gandalf turned into different colours and set dancing up by the roof to amuse them. They talked and talked and forgot about the storm and discussed what each would do with his share of the treasure when they got it, which at the moment did not seem so impossible. And so they dropped off to sleep one by one. And that was the last time that they used the ponies, packages, baggages, tools and paraphernalia that they had brought with them. It turned out a good thing that night that they had brought little Bilbo with them after all. For somehow, he could not go to sleep for a long while. And when he did sleep, he had very nasty dreams. He dreamed that a crack in the wall at the back of the cave got bigger and bigger and opened wider and wider, and he was very afraid, but could not call out or do anything but lie and look. Then he dreamed that the floor of the cave was giving way and he was slipping, beginning to fall down, down, goodness knows where to. At that, he woke up with a horrible start and found that part of his dream was true. A crack had opened at the back of the cave and was already a wide passage. He was just in time to see the last of the pony's tails disappearing into it. Of course, he gave a very loud yell, as loud a yell as a hobbit can give, which is surprising for their size. Out jumped the goblins. Big goblins, great ugly looking goblins. Lots of goblins, before you could say rocks and blocks. There were six to each dwarf, at least, and two even for Bilbo. And they were all grabbed and carried through the crack before you could say tinder and flint. But not Gandalf. Bilbo's yell had done that much good. It had wakened him up wide in a splintered second, and when goblins came to grab him, there was a terrific flash like lightning in the cave, a smell like gunpowder, and several of them fell dead. The crack closed with a snap, and Bilbo and the dwarves were on the wrong side of it. Where was Gandalf? Of that, neither they nor the goblins had any idea, and the goblins did not wait to find out. They seized Bilbo and the dwarves and hurried them along. It was deep, deep, dark, such as only goblins that have taken to living in the heart of the mountains can see through. The passages there were crossed and tangled in all directions, but the goblins knew their way, as well as you do to the nearest post office. And the way went down and down, and it was most horribly stuffy. The goblins were very rough and pinched unmercifully and chuckled and laughed in their horrible stony voices. And Bilbo was more unhappy even than when the troll had picked him up by his toes. He wished again and again for his nice little bright hobbit hole, not for the last time. Now there came a glimmer of a red light before them. The goblins began to sing or croak, keeping time with the flap of their flat feet on the stone and shaking their prisoners as well. Clap, snap, the black crack, grip, grab, pinch, nab, and down, down to goblin town you go, my lad. Clash, crash, crush, smash, hammer and tongs, knocker and gongs, pound, pound, far underground, ho, ho, my lad. Swish, smack, whip, crack, batter and beat, yammer and bleat, work, work, nor dare to shirk, while goblins cough and goblins laugh, round and round, far underground, below, my lad. It sounded truly terrifying. The walls echoed to the clap, snap and crush, smash, and to the ugly laughter of their ho, ho, my lad. The general meaning of the song was only too plain. For now the goblins took out whips and whipped them with a swish smack and set them running as fast as they could in front of them. And more than one of the dwarves were already yammering and bleating like anything when they stumbled into a big cavern. It was lit by a great red fire in the middle and by torches along the walls and it was full of goblins. They all laughed and stamped and clapped their hands when the dwarves, with poor little Bilbo at the back, 
and nearest to the whips, came running in while the goblin drivers whooped and cracked their whips behind. The ponies were already there, huddled in a corner, and there were all the baggages and packages lying broken open and being rummaged by goblins and smelt by goblins and fingered by goblins and quarrelled over by goblins. I am afraid that was the last they ever saw of those excellent little ponies, including a jolly sturdy little white fellow that Elrond had lent to Gandalf, since his horse was not suitable for the mountain paths. For goblins eat horses, and ponies, and donkeys, and other much more dreadful things, and they are always hungry. Just now, however, the prisoners were thinking only of themselves. The goblins chained their hands behind their backs and linked them all together in a line and dragged them to the far end of the cavern with little Bilbo tugging at the end of the row. There in the shadows, on a large flat stone, sat a tremendous goblin with a huge head and armed goblins were standing round him carrying the axes and the bent swords that they used. Now, goblins are cruel, wicked, and bad-hearted. They make no beautiful things, but they make many clever ones. They can tunnel and mine as well as any but the most skilled dwarves when they take the trouble, though they are usually untidy and dirty. Hammers, axes, swords, daggers, pickaxes, tongs, and also instruments of torture they make very well, or get other people to make to their design, prisoners and slaves that have to work till they die for want of air and light. It is not unlikely that they invented some of the machines that have since troubled the world, especially the ingenious devices for killing large numbers of people at once. For wheels and engines and explosions always delighted them, and also not working with their own hands more than they could help. But in those days, in those wild parts, they had not advanced, as it is called, so far. They did not hate dwarves especially, no more than they hated everybody and everything, and particularly the orderly and prosperous. In some parts, wicked dwarves had even made alliances with them. But they had a special grudge against Thorin's people because of the war, which you have heard mentioned, and which does not come into this tale. And anyway, goblins don't care who they catch, as long as it is done smart, secret, and the prisoners are not able to defend themselves. Who are these miserable persons? said the great goblin. Dwarves! And this! said one of the drivers, pulling at Bilbo's chain so that he fell forward onto his knees. We found them sheltering on our front porch. What do you mean by it? said the great goblin, turning to Thorin. Up to no good, I'll warrant. Spying on the private business of my people, I guess. Thieves, I shouldn't be surprised to learn. Murderers and elf friends, not unlikely. Come, what have you got to say? Thorin, the dwarf, at your service, he replied. It was merely a polite nothing. Of the things which you suspect and imagine, we had no idea at all. We sheltered from a storm in what seemed a convenient cave and unused. Nothing was further from our thoughts than inconveniencing goblins in any way, whatever. That was true enough. Um, said the great goblin. So you say, might I ask, what were you doing up in the mountains at all? And where you were coming from? And where you are going to? In fact, I should like to know all about you. Not that it'll do you much good, Thorin Oakenshield. I know too much about your folk already. But let's have the truth, or I will prepare something particularly uncomfortable for you. We were on a journey to visit our relatives, our nephews and nieces, and first, second, and third cousins, and the other descendants of our grandfathers who live on the east side of these truly hospitable mountains, said Thorin, not quite knowing what to say all at once in a moment, when obviously the exact truth would not do at all. He is a liar, O oh, truly tremendous one, said one of the drivers. Several of our people were struck by lightning in the cave when we invited these creatures to come below, and they are dead as stones. Also, he has not explained this. 
He held out the sword which Thorin had worn, the sword which came from the troll's lair. The great goblin gave a truly awful howl of rage when he looked at it, and all his soldiers gnashed their teeth, clashed their shields, and stamped. They knew the sword at once. It had killed hundreds of goblins in its time, when the fair elves of Gondolin had hunted them in the hills, or did battle before their walls. They had called it Orcrist, Goblin Cleaver. But the goblins simply called it Biter. They hated it, and hated worse, anyone that carried it. Murderers and elf friends, the great goblin shouted. Slash them, beat them, bite them, gnash them. Take them away to dark holes full of snakes and never let them see the light again. He was in such a rage that he jumped off his seat and himself rushed at Thorin with his mouth open. Just at that moment, all the lights in the cavern went out and the great fire went off, poof, into a tower of blue glowing smoke right up to the roof that scattered piercing white sparks all among the goblins. The yells and yammering, croaking, gibbering, jabbering, howls, growls and curses, shrieking and shriking that followed were beyond description. Several hundred wild cats and wolves, being roasted slowly alive together, would not have compared with it. The sparks were burning holes in the goblins, and the smoke that now fell from the roof made the air too thick for even their eyes to see through. Soon they were falling over one another and rolling in heaps on the floor, biting and kicking and fighting as if they had all gone mad. Suddenly a sword flashed in its own light. Bilbo saw it go right through the great goblin as he stood, dumbfounded in the middle of his rage. He fell dead, and the goblin soldiers fled before the sword, shrieking into the darkness. The sword went back into its sheath. Follow me, quick! said a voice, fierce and quiet, and before Bilbo understood what was happening, he was trotting along again as fast as he could at the end of the line, down more dark passages, with the yells of the goblin hall growing fainter behind him. A pale light was leading them on. Quicker, quicker, said the voice. The torches will soon be relit. Half a minute, said Dory, who was at the back, next to Bilbo, and a decent fellow. He made the hobbit scramble on his shoulders as best as he could with tied hands, and then they off went all at a run again, with a clink clink of chains, and many a stumble, since they had no hands to steady themselves with. Not for a long while did they stop, and by that time they must have been right down in the very mountain's heart. Then Gandalf lit up his wand. Of course it was Gandalf, but just then they were too busy to ask how he got there. He took out his sword again, and again it flashed in the dark by itself. It burned with a rage that made it gleam if goblins were about, and now it was bright as blue flame for delight in the killing of the great lord of the cave. It made no trouble whatever cutting through the goblin chains and setting all the prisoners free as quickly as possible. This sword's name was Glamdring, the foe hammer, if you remember. The goblins just called it Beta, and hated it worse than Biter, if possible. Orcrist, too, had been saved, for Gandalf had brought it along as well, snatching it from one of the terrified guards. Gandalf thought of most things, and though he could not do everything, he could do a great deal for friends in a tight corner. Are we all here? he said, handing his sword back to Thorin with a bow. Let me see. One, that's Thorin. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Where are Feely and Keely? Huh? Here they are. Twelve. Thirteen, and here's Mr. Baggins, fourteen. Well, well, it might be worse. Uh, and then again, it might be a good deal better. No ponies, no food, and no knowing quite where we are. And hordes of angry goblins just behind. On we go. On they went. Gandalf was quite right. They began to hear goblin noises and horrible cries far behind in the passages they had come through. That sent them on faster than ever. And as poor Bilbo could not possibly go half as fast, for dwarves can roll along at a tremendous pace, I can tell you, when they have to, they took it in turns to carry him on their backs. Still, goblins go faster than dwarves, and these goblins knew the way better. They had made the paths themselves, and were madly angry, so that do what they could, the dwarves heard the cries and howls getting closer and closer. 
Soon they could even hear the flap of the goblin feet, many, many feet, which seemed only just around the last corner. The blink of red torches could be seen behind them in the tunnel they were following, and they were getting deadly tired. Oh, why did I ever leave my hobbit hole? said poor Mr. Baggins, bumping up and down on Bombo's back. Why, why did I ever bring a wretched little hobbit on a treasure hunt? said poor Bomber, who was fat, and staggered along with the sweat dripping down his nose in the heat and terror. At this point, Gandalf fell behind and Thorin with him. They turned a sharp corner. About turn, he shouted. Draw your sword, Thorin. There was nothing else to be done, and the goblins did not like it. They came scurrying round the corner in full cry and found goblin cleaver and foe hammer shining cold and bright right in their astonished eyes. The ones in front dropped their torches and gave one yell before they were killed. The ones behind yelled still more and leapt back, knocking over those that were running after them. Bite her and beat her, they shrieked, and soon they were all in confusion and most of them were hustling back the way they had come. It was quite a long while before any of them dared to turn that corner. By that time, the dwarves had gone on again, a long, long way on into the dark tunnels of the goblins' realm. When the goblins discovered that, they put out their torches, and they slipped on soft shoes, and they chose out their very quickest runners with the sharpest ears and eyes. These ran forward, as swift as weasels in the dark, and with hardly any more noise than bats. And that is why neither Bilbo, nor the dwarves, nor even Gandalf heard them coming, nor did they see them, but they were seen by the goblins that ran silently up behind, for Gandalf was letting his wand give out a faint light to help the dwarves as they went along. Quite suddenly, Dory, now at the back again, carrying Bilbo, was grabbed from behind in the dark. He shouted and fell, and the hobbit rolled off his shoulders into the blackness, bumped his head on a hard rock, and remembered nothing more. When Bilbo opened his eyes, he wondered if he had, for it was just as dark as with them shut. No one was anywhere near him. Just imagine his fright. He could hear nothing, see nothing, and he could feel nothing except the stone of the floor. Very slowly he got up and groped about on all fours till he touched the wall of the tunnel. But neither up nor down it could he find anything, nothing at all. No sign of goblins, no sign of dwarves. His head was swimming, and he was far from certain even of the direction they had been going in when he had had his fall. He guessed as well as he could, and crawled along for a good way, till suddenly his hand met what felt like a tiny ring of cold metal lying on the floor of the tunnel. It was a turning point in his career, but he did not know it. He put the ring in his pocket almost without thinking, Certainly, it did not seem of any particular use at the moment. He did not go much further, but sat down on the cold floor and gave himself up to complete miserableness for a long while. He thought of himself frying bacon and eggs in his own kitchen at home, for he could feel inside that it was high time for some meal or other, but that only made him miserabler. He could not think what to do. He could not think what had happened or why he had been left behind. Or why, if he had been left behind, the goblins had not caught him, or even why his head was so sore. The truth was, he had been lying quiet, out of sight and out of mind, in a very dark corner for a long while. After some time, he felt for his pipe. It was not broken, and that was something. Then he felt for his pouch, and there was some tobacco in it, and that was something more. Then he felt for matches, and he could not find any at all, and that shattered his hopes completely. Just as well for him, as he agreed when he came to his senses, goodness knows what the striking of matches and the smell of tobacco would have brought on him out of dark holes in that horrible place. Still, at the moment, he felt very crushed. But in slapping all his pockets and feeling all round himself for matches, 
His hand came on the hilt of his little sword, the little dagger that he got from the trolls, and that he had quite forgotten, nor fortunately had the goblins noticed it as he wore it inside his breeches. Now he drew it out. It shone pale and dim before his eyes. Oh, no, it's an elvish blade too, he thought, and goblins are not very near, and yet not far enough. But somehow he was comforted. It was rather splendid to be wearing a blade made in Gondolin for the Goblin Wars, of which so many songs had sung, and also he had noticed that such weapons made a great impression on goblins that came upon them suddenly. Go back, he thought. No good at all. Go sideways? Impossible. Go forward. Only thing to do. On we go. So up he got and trotted along with his little sword held in front of him, and one hand feeling the wall, and his heart all of a pitter and a patter. Now, certainly Bilbo was in what is called a tight place, but you must remember it was not quite so tight for him as it would have been for me or for you. Hobbits are not quite like ordinary people, and after all, if their holes are nice, cheery places and properly aired, quite different from the tunnels of the goblins, Still, they are more used to tunnelling than we are, and they do not easily lose their sense of direction underground, not when their heads have recovered from being bumped. Also, they can move very quietly, and hide easily, and recover wonderfully from falls and bruises. And they have a fund of wisdom and wise sayings that men have mostly never heard or have forgotten long ago. I should not have liked to have been in Mr. Baggins' place all the same, the tunnel seemed to have no end. All he knew was that it was still going down pretty steadily and keeping in the same direction, in spite of a twist or a turn or two. There were passages leading off to the side every now and then, as he knew by the glimmer of his sword, or could feel with his hand on the wall. Of these he took no notice except to hurry past, for fear of the goblins, or half-imagined dark things coming out of them. On and on he went, and down and down, and still he heard no sound of anything except the occasional whir of a bat by his ears, which startled him at first till it became too frequent to bother about. I do not know how long he kept on like this, hating to go on, not daring to stop, on, on, till he was tireder than tired. It seemed like all the way to tomorrow and over it in the days beyond. Suddenly, without any warning, he trotted splash into water. Ugh, it was icy cold. That pulled him up sharp and short. He did not know whether it was just a pool in the path, or the edge of an underground stream that crossed the passage, or the brink of a deep, dark, subterranean lake. The sword was hardly shining at all. He stopped, and he could hear, when he listened hard, drop, drip, drip, dripping from an unseen roof into the water below, but there seemed no other sort of sound. Oh, so it is a pool, or a lake, and not an underground river, he thought. Still, he did not dare to wade out into the darkness. He could not swim, and he thought, too, of nasty, slimy things with big, bulging, blind eyes wriggling in the water. There are strange things living in the pools and lakes in the hearts of mountains, fish whose fathers swam in, goodness only knows how many years ago, and never swam out again, while their eyes grew bigger and bigger and bigger from trying to see in the blackness. Also, there are other things more slimy than fish. Even in the tunnels and caves the goblins have made for themselves, there are other things living, unbeknown to them, that have sneaked in from outside to lie up in the dark. Some of these caves, too, go back in their beginnings to ages before the goblins, who only widened them and joined them up with passages. And the original owners are still there, in odd corners, blinking and nosing about. Deep down here, by the dark water, lived old Gollum, a small, slimy creature. I don't know where he came from, 
nor who or what he was. He was Gollum, as dark as darkness, except for two big, round, pale eyes in his thin face. He had a little boat, and he rowed about quite quietly on the lake, for a lake it was, wide and deep and deadly cold. He paddled it with large feet dangling over the side, but never a ripple did he make, not he. He was looking out of his pale, lamp-like eyes for blind fish, which he grabbed with his long fingers as quick as thinking. He liked meat, too. Goblin he thought good when he could get it, but he took care they never found him out. He just throttled them from behind, if they ever came down alone anywhere near the edge of the water while he was prowling about. They very seldom did, for they had a feeling that something unpleasant was lurking down there, down at the very roots of the mountain. They had come on the lake when they were tunnelling down long ago, and they found they could go no further. So there, their road ended in that direction, and there was no reason to go that way unless the great goblin sent them. Sometimes he took a fancy for fish from the lake, and sometimes neither goblin nor fish came back. Actually, Gollum lived on a slimy island of rock in the middle of the lake. He was watching Bilbo now from the distance with his pale eyes like telescopes. Bilbo could not see him, but he was wondering a lot about Bilbo, for he could see that he was no goblin at all. Gollum got into his boat and shot off from the island, while Bilbo was sitting on the brink, altogether flummoxed, and at the end of his way and his wits. Suddenly, up came Gollum, and whispered and hissed, Bless us and splash us, my precious. I guess it's a choice feast. At least, a tasty morsel it would make us. Gollum. And when he said Gollum, he made a horrible swallowing noise in his throat. That is how he got his name. Although he always called himself my precious. The hobbit jumped nearly out of his skin when the hiss came in his ears, and he suddenly saw the pale eyes sticking out at him. Who, who are you? He said, thrusting his dagger in front of him. <laughs> what is he, my precious? whispered Gollum, who always spoke to himself through having never anyone else to talk to. This is what he had come to find out, for he was not really very hungry at the moment, only curious. Otherwise, he would have grabbed first and whispered afterwards. Oh, I am Mr. Bilbo Baggins. I've lost the dwarves, and I've lost the wizard, and I don't know where I am, and I don't want to know. If only I can get away. What's he got in his hands is, said Gollum, looking at the sword, which he did not quite like. A, a sword, a blade which came out of Gondolin. Said Gollum, and became quite polite. Perhaps he sits here and, and chats with it a bit, say, my precious. It, it likes riddles. Perhaps it does, does it? He was anxious to appear friendly, at any rate for the moment, until he found out more about the sword and the hobbit, whether he was quite alone, really, whether he was good to eat, and whether Gollum was really hungry. Riddles were all he could think of. Asking them, and sometimes guessing them, had been the only game he had ever played with other funny creatures sitting in their holes in the long, long ago, before he lost all his friends and was driven away, alone, and crept down, down into the dark under the mountains. Uh, very well, said Bilbo, who was anxious to agree until he found out more about the creature, whether he was quite alone, whether he was fierce or hungry, and whether he was a friend of the goblins. Uh, you ask first, he said, because he had not had time to think of a riddle. So Gollum hissed. What has roots as nobody sees is taller than trees. Up, up he goes, and yet never grows. Oh, easy, said Bilbo. Uh, mountain, I suppose. <laughs> Does it guess easy? It must have a competition with us, my precious. If precious asks and it doesn't answer, we eat it, my precious. If 
if it asks us and we doesn't answer, and we does what it wants, eh? We shows it the way out, yes? Uh, uh, all right, said Bilbo, not daring to disagree, and nearly bursting his brain to think of riddles that could save him from being eaten. Uh, uh, oh, um, 30 white horses on a red hill. First they champ, then they stamp, then they stand still. That was all he could think of to ask. The idea of eating was rather on his mind. It was rather an old one, too, and Gollum knew the answer as well as you do. Chestnuts, chestnuts, he hissed. Teeth, teeth, my precious, but we has only six. Then he asked his second. Voiceless it cries, wingless flutters, toothless bites, mouthless mutters. Uh, uh, oh. Half a moment, cried Bilbo, who was still thinking uncomfortably about eating. Fortunately, he had once heard something rather like this before, and getting his wits back, he thought of the answer. Wind, wind, of course, he said. And he was so pleased that he made up one on the spot. This will puzzle the nasty little underground creature, he thought. Uh, an eye in a blue face saw an eye in a green face, and that eye is like to this eye, said the first eye, but in low place, not in high place. Said Gollum. He had been underground a long, long time and was forgetting this sort of thing. But just as Bilbo was beginning to hope that the wretch would not be able to answer, Gollum brought up memories of ages and ages and ages before, when he lived with his grandmother in a hole in a bank by a river. <laughs> Precious, he said. <laughs> Son, on the daisies, it means it does. But these ordinary above ground everyday sort of riddles were tiring for him. Also, they reminded him of days when he had been less lonely and sneaky and nasty, and that put him out of temper. What is more, they made him hungry. So this time he tried something a bit more difficult and more unpleasant. It cannot be seen, it cannot be felt, cannot be heard, cannot be smelt. It lies behind stars and under hills and empty holes it fills. It comes first and follows after, ends life, kills after. Unfortunately for Gollum, Bilbo had heard that sort of thing before, and the answer was all around him anyway. It's dark, he said, without even scratching his head or putting on his thinking cap. Um, hmm, uh, a, a box without hinges, key or lid, yet golden treasure inside is hid, he asked to gain time until he could think of a really hard one. This, he thought, a dreadfully easy chestnut, though he had not asked it in the usual words. But it proved a nasty poser for Gollum. He hissed to himself, and still he did not answer. He whispered and spluttered. After some while, Bilbo became impatient. Well, what is it? He said. The answer's not a kettle boiling over, as you seem to think, from the noise you're making. Oh, give us a chance. Let it give us a chance, my precious. Well, said Bilbo, after giving him a long chance, what about your guest? But suddenly Gollum remembered thieving from nests long ago and sitting under the riverbank, teaching his grandmother, teaching his grandmother to suck eggses, he hissed, eggses it is. And then he asked, alive without breath, as cold as death, never thirsty, never drinking, all in mail, never clinking. He also, in his turn, thought this was a dreadfully easy one, because he was always thinking of the answer. But he could not remember anything better at the moment he was so flustered by the egg question. All the same, it was a poser for poor Bilbo, who never had anything to do with the water if he could help it. I imagine you know the answer, of course, 
or can guess as easy as winking, since you are sitting comfortably at home and have not the danger of being eaten to disturb your thinking. Bilbo sat and cleared his throat once or twice, but no answer came. After a while, Gollum began to hiss with pleasure to himself. Is it nice, my precious? Is it juicy? Is it scrumptiously crunchable? He began to peer at Bilbo out of the darkness. <laughs> Half a moment, said the hobbit, shivering. I gave you a good long chance just now. It must make haste, haste, said Gollum, beginning to climb out of his boat onto the shore to get at Bilbo. But when he put his long webby foot in the water, a fish jumped out in a fright and fell on Bilbo's toes. Oh, he said, it's cold and clammy. And so he guessed. Oh, uh, fish, fish, he cried. It's fish. Gollum was dreadfully disappointed. But Bilbo asked another riddle as quick as he could, so that Gollum had to get back into his boat and think. Uh, 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 no legs lay on one leg, uh, two legs sat near on three legs, four legs got some. It was not really the right time for this riddle, but Bilbo was in a hurry. Gollum might have had some trouble guessing it if he had asked it at another time. As it was, talking of fish, no legs, was not so very difficult, and after that the rest was easy. Fish on a little table, man at table sitting on a stool, the cat has the bones. That, of course, is the answer, and Gollum soon gave it. Then he thought the time had come to ask something hard and horrible. This is what he said. This thing, all things devours, birds, beasts, trees, flowers, gnaws iron, bites steel, grinds hard stones to meal, lays kings, ruins town and beats High Mountain down. Poor Bilbo sat in the dark, thinking of all the horrible names of all the giants and ogres he had ever heard told of in tales, but not one of them had done all those things. He had a feeling that the answer was quite different, and that he ought to know it, but he could not think of it. He began to get frightened, and that is bad for thinking. Gollum began to get out of his boat. He flapped into the water, and paddled to the bank. Bilbo could see his eyes coming towards him. His tongue seemed to stick in his mouth. He wanted to shout out, oh, give me more time, give me more, give, give, more, more time. But all that came out was a sudden squeal, time, time. Bilbo was saved by pure luck, for that, of course, was the answer. Gollum was disappointed once more, and now he was getting angry and also tired of the game. It had made him very hungry indeed. This time he did not go back to the boat. He sat down in the dark by Bilbo. That made the hobbit most dreadfully uncomfortable and scattered his wits. It's got to ask us a question, my precious. Yes, yes, yes. Just one more question to guess. Yes, yes, said Gollum. But Bilbo simply could not think of any question with that nasty, wet, cold thing sitting next to him and pouring and poking him. He scratched himself, pinched himself. Still, he could not think of anything. Ask us, ask us, said Gollum. Bilbo pinched himself and slapped himself. He gripped on his little sword. He even felt in his pocket with his other hand. And there he found the ring he had picked up in the passage and forgotten about. Oh, what have I got in my pocket? he said aloud. He was talking to himself, but Gollum thought it was a riddle, and he was frightfully upset. <laughs> not fair, not fair, he hissed. It isn't fair, my precious, is it, to ask us what it's got in its nasty little pockets is? Bilbo, seeing what had happened and having nothing better to ask, stuck to his question. What have I got in my pocket? he said louder. <laughs> hissed Gollum. It must give us three guesses, my precious, three guesses. Mm, very well, guess away, said Bilbo. Hanses, said Gollum. Wrong, said Bilbo, who had luckily just taken his hand out again. Guess again. 
<laughs> said Gollum, more upset than ever. He thought of all the things he kept in his own pockets. Fish bones, goblins' teeth, wet shells, a bit of bat wing, a sharp stone to sharpen his fangs on, and other nasty things. He tried to think what other people kept in their pockets. Knife, he said at last. Wrong, said Bilbo, who had lost his some time ago. Last guess. Now Gollum was in a much worse state than when Bilbo had asked him the egg question. He hissed and spluttered and rocked himself backwards and forwards and slapped his feet on the floor and wriggled and squirmed, but still he did not dare to waste his last guess. Come on, said Bilbo. I am waiting. He tried to sound bold and cheerful, but he did not feel at all sure how the game was going to end, whether Gollum guessed right or not. Time's up, he said. String or nothing, shrieked Gollum, which was not quite fair, working in two guesses at once. Both wrong, cried Bilbo, very much relieved and he jumped at once to his feet, put his back to the nearest wall, and held out his little sword. He knew, of course, that the riddle game was sacred and of immense antiquity, and even wicked creatures were afraid to cheat when they played at it. But he felt he could not trust this slimy thing to keep any promise at a pinch. Any excuse would do for him to slide out of it. And, after all, that last question had not been a genuine riddle, according to the ancient laws. But at any rate, Gollum did not at once attack him. He could see the sword in Bilbo's hand. He sat still, shivering and whispering. At last, Bilbo could wait no longer. Well, he said, what about your promise? I want to go, and you must show me the way. <laughs> did we say so, precious? So the nasty little baggins is the way out, yes, yes? But what has it got in its pockets, is eh? Not string, precious, but not nothing. Oh, oh no. Never you mind, said Bilbo. A promise is a promise. Cross it is, impatient, precious, hissed Gollum. But it must wait, yes, it must wait. We can't go up tunnels so hasty. We must go and get some things first, yes, things to help us. Well, hurry up, said Bilbo, relieved to think of Gollum going away. He thought he was just making an excuse and did not mean to come back. What was Gollum talking about? What useful thing could he keep out on the dark lake? But he was wrong. Gollum did mean to come back. He was angry now and hungry, and he was a wiz wicked, w wicked, miserable creature. And already, he had a plan. Not far away was his island, of which Bilbo knew nothing. And there, in his hiding place, he kept a few wretched oddments and one very beautiful thing. Very beautiful, very wonderful. He had a ring, a golden ring, a precious ring. <laughs> My birthday present, he whispered to himself, as he had often done in the endless dark days. That's what we want now. Yes, we want it. He wanted it because it was a ring of power. And if you slipped that ring on your finger, you were invisible. Only in the full sunlight could you be seen, and then only by your shadow. And that would be shaky and faint. My birthday present, it came to me, and my birthday, my precious. So he had always said to himself. But... Who knows how Gollum came by that present, ages ago, in the old days when such rings were still at large in the world. Perhaps even the master who ruled them could not have said. Gollum used to wear it at first, till it tired him, and then he kept it in a pouch next to his skin, till it galled him, and now usually he hid it in a hole in the rock on his island, and was always going back to look at it. And still sometimes he put it on, when he could not bear to be parted from it any longer, or when he was very, very hungry and tired of fish. Then he would creep along dark passages, looking for stray goblins. He might even venture into places where the torches were lit, and made his eyes blink and smart, for he would be safe, 
Oh yes, quite safe. No one would see him. No one would notice him till he had his fingers on their throat. Only a few hours ago, he had worn it and caught a small goblin imp. How it squeaked. He still had a bone or two left to gnaw, but he wanted something softer. Quite safe, yes, he whispered to himself. It won't see us, will it, my precious? No, it won't see us, and its nasty little sword will be quite useless. Yes, quite. That is what was in his wicked little mind as he slipped suddenly from Bilbo's side and flapped back to his boat and went off into the dark. Bilbo thought he had heard the last of him. Still, he waited a while, for he had no idea how to find his way out alone. Suddenly, Bilbo heard a screech. It sent a shiver down his back. Gollum was cursing and wailing away in the gloom, not very far off by the sound of it. He was on his island, scrabbling here and there, searching and seeking in vain. Where is it? Where is it? Bilbo heard him crying. Lost it is, my precious, lost, lost. Curses and curses, my precious is lost. Uh, what's the matter? Bilbo called. What have you lost? It mustn't ask us, shrieked Gollum. Not its business, no. It's lost. Well, well so am I cried Bilbo, and I want to get unlost. And I won the game, and you promised, so come along. Come and let me out, and then go on with your looking. Utterly miserable as Gollum sounded, Bilbo could not find much pity in his heart. and He had a feeling that anything Gollum wanted so much could hardly be something good. Come along, he shouted. No, not yet, precious, Gollum answered. We must search for it. It's lost. But you never guessed my last question, and you promised, said Bilbo. Never guessed, said Gollum. And then suddenly out of the gloom came a sharp, Sss! Not as it got in its pocket, says. Tell us that. It must tell first. As far as Bilbo knew, there was no particular reason why he should not tell. Gollum's mind had jumped to a guess quicker than his. Naturally, for Gollum had brooded for ages on this one thing, and he was always afraid of its being stolen. But Bilbo was annoyed at the delay. After all, he had won the game, pretty fairly, at a horrible risk. Your answers were to be guessed, not given, he said. But it wasn't a fair question, said Gollum. Not a riddle, precious, no. Uh, well, uh, if it's a matter of ordinary questions, Bilbo replied, then I asked one first. What have you lost? Tell me that. What has it got in its pocket, says? The sound came hissing louder and sharper, and as he looked towards it to his alarm, Bilbo now saw two small points of light peering at him. As suspicion grew in Gollum's mind, the light of his eyes burned with a pale flame. What have you lost? Bilbo persisted. But now the light in Gollum's eyes had become a green fire, and it was coming swiftly nearer. Gollum was in his boat again, paddling wildly back to the dark shore, and such a rage of loss and suspicion was in his heart that no sword had any more terror for him. Bilbo could not guess what had maddened the wretched creature, but he saw that all was up, and that Gollum meant to murder him at any rate. Just in time, he turned and ran blindly back up the dark passage down which he had come, keeping close to the wall and feeling it with his left hand. What has it got in its pocket, says? He heard the hiss loud behind him and the splash as Gollum leapt from his boat. What have I? I wonder, he said to himself as he panted and stumbled along. He put his left hand in his pocket. The ring felt very cold as it quietly slipped onto his groping forefinger. The hiss was close behind him. He turned now and saw Gollum's eyes like small green lamps coming up the slope. Terrified, he tried to run faster, but suddenly he struck his toes on a snag in the floor and fell flat with his little sword under him. In a moment, Gollum was on him. But before Bilbo could do anything, recover his breath, pick himself up, or wave his sword, Gollum passed by, taking no notice of him, cursing and whispering as he ran. What could it mean? Gollum could see in the dark, 
Bilbo could see the light of his eyes, palely shining even from behind. Painfully, he got up and sheathed his sword, which was now glowing faintly again, and then very cautiously he followed. There seemed nothing else to do. It was no good crawling back down to Gollum's water. Perhaps if he followed him, Gollum might lead him to some way of escape without meaning to. That's curse it, curse it, curse it, hissed Gollum. Curse the Baggins! It's gone! What has it got in its pocket, says? Oh, we guessed, my guess, my precious, he's found it. Yes, he must have my birthday present. Bilbo pricked up his ears. He was at last beginning to guess himself. He hurried a little, getting as close as he dared behind Gollum, who was still going quickly, not looking back, but turning his head from side to side, as Bilbo could see from the faint glimmer on the walls. My birthday present? Curse it! How did I lose it, my precious? Yes, that's it. We came this way last, when we twisted that nasty young squeaker. That's it. Curse it! It slipped from us. After all these ages and ages, is, is it gone? <laughs> Suddenly, Gollum sat down and began to weep, a whistling, gurgling sound, horrible to listen to. Bilbo halted and flattened himself against the tunnel wall. After a while, Gollum stopped weeping and began to talk. He seemed to be having an argument with himself. It's no good going back there to search, no. We doesn't remember all the places we visited. And it's no use. The Baggins has got it in its pocket system. Nasty Noser has found it, we says. Guesses, precious, only guesses. We can't know till we find the nasty creature and squeezes it. But it doesn't know what the present can do, does it? It will just keep it in its pockets. It doesn't know. And it can't go far. It's lost itself, the nasty nosy thing. It doesn't know the way out. It said so. It said so, yes, but it's tricksy. It doesn't say what it means. It won't say what it's got in its pockets is. It knows. It knows a way in. It must know a way out. Yes, it's off to the back door. To the back door, that's it. The goblinses will catch it then. Oh, it can't get out that way, precious. <laughs> goblinses is... But if it's got the present, our precious present, then goblinses will get it. They'll find it. They'll find out what it does. We shan't ever be safe again. Never. One of the goblinses will put it on, and then no one will see him. He'll be there, but not seen. Not even our clever eyes will notice him. And he'll come, creepsy tricksy, and catch us. Let's stop talking, precious, and make haste. If the Baggins has gone that way, we must go and see. Go. Not far now, make haste. With a spring, Gollum got up and started shambling off at a great pace. Bilbo hurried after him, still cautiously, though his chief fear now was of tripping on another snag and falling with a noise. His head was in a whirl of hope and wonder. It seemed that the ring he had was a magic ring. It made you invisible. He had heard of such things, of course, in old, old tales, but it was hard to believe that he had really found one, by accident. Still, there it was. Gollum, with his bright green eyes, had passed him by, only a yard to one side. On they went, Gollum flip-flapping ahead, hissing and cursing, Bilbo going as softly as a hobbit can. Soon they came to places where, as Bilbo had noticed on the way down, side passages opened, this way and that. Gollum began at once to count them. One left, yes, one right, two right, yes, yes, two left, yes, yes, and so on and on. As the count grew, he slowed down, and he began to get shaky and weepy, for he was leaving the water further and further behind, and he was getting afraid. Goblins might be about, and he had lost his ring. At last he stopped by a low opening, on their left as they went up, Seven right, yes, six left, yes, he whispered. This is it, this is the way to the back door, yes, here's the passage. He peered in, 
and shrank back. But we don't go in, precious. No, we don't. Goblins is down there, lots of goblins is. We smells them. <sighs> Not so we do. Curse them and cross them. We must wait here, precious. Wait a bit and see. So they came to a dead stop. Gollum had brought Bilbo to the way out after all, but Bilbo could not get in. There was Gollum, sitting, humped up, right in the opening, and his eyes gleamed cold in his head as he swayed it from side to side between his knees. Bilbo crept away from the wall, more quietly than a mouse, but Gollum stiffened at once and sniffed, and his eyes went green. He hissed softly but menacingly. He could not see the hobbit, but now he was on the alert, and he had other senses that the darkness had sharpened, hearing and smell. He seemed to be crouched right down, with his flat hands splayed on the floor and his head thrust out, nose almost to the stone. Though he was only a black shadow in the gleam of his own eyes, Bilbo could see or feel that he was tense as a bowstring gathered for a spring. Bilbo almost stopped breathing and went stiff himself. He was desperate. He must get away, out of this horrible darkness, while he had any strength left. He must fight. He must stab the foul thing, put its eyes out, kill it. It meant to kill him. No, not a fair fight. He was invisible now. Gollum had no sword. Gollum had not actually threatened to kill him, or tried to yet. And he was miserable, alone, lost. A sudden understanding, a pity mixed with horror, welled up in Bilbo's heart. A glimpse of endless, unmarked days, without light or hope of betterment, hard stone, cold fish, sneaking and whispering. All these thoughts passed in a flash of a second. He trembled. Then, quite suddenly, in another flash, as if lifted by a new strength and resolve, he leapt. No great leap for a man, but a leap in the dark. Straight over Gollum's head he jumped, seven feet forward and three in the air. Indeed, had he known it, he only just missed cracking his skull on the low arch of the passage. Gollum threw himself backwards and grabbed as the hobbit flew over him, but too late, his hands snapped on thin air, and Bilbo, falling fair on his sturdy feet, sped off down the new tunnel. He did not turn to see what Gollum was doing. There was a hissing and cursing almost at his heels at first, and then it stopped. All at once there came a blood-curdling shriek, filled with hatred and despair. Gollum was defeated. He dared go no further. He had lost, lost his prey, and lost, too, the only thing he had ever cared for, his precious. The cry brought Bilbo's heart to his mouth, but still he held on. Now, faint as an echo, but menacing, the voice came behind. Thief! 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 Baggins, we hates it! We hates it! We hates it forever! And then there was a silence. But that too seemed menacing to Bilbo. If goblins are so near that he smelt them, he thought, well then they'll have heard his shrieking and cursing. Careful now, or this will lead you to worse things. The passage was low and roughly made. It was not too difficult for the hobbit, except when, in spite of all care, he stubbed his poor toes again several times on nasty, jagged stones in the floor. A bit low for goblins, at least for the big ones, thought Bilbo, not knowing that even the big ones, the orcs of the mountains, go along at a great speed, stooping low with their hands almost on the ground. Soon the passage that had been sloping down began to go up again, and after a while it climbed steeply. That slowed Bilbo down, but at last the slope stopped, the passage turned a corner and dipped down again, and there, at the bottom of a short incline, he saw, filtering round another corner, a glimpse of light. Not red light, as of fire or lantern, but a pale, out-of-doors sort of light. Then Bilbo began to run. Scuttling as fast as his legs would carry him, he turned the last corner and came suddenly right into an open space, where the light after all that time in the dark, seemed dazzlingly bright. Really, it was only a leak of sunshine in through a doorway, where a great door, a stone door, was left standing open. Bilbo blinked, 
And then suddenly he saw the goblins, goblins in full armor with drawn swords sitting just inside the door and watching it with wide eyes and watching the passage that led to it. They were aroused, alert, and ready for anything. They saw him sooner than he saw them. Yes, they saw him. Whether it was an accident or a last trick of the ring before it took a new master, it was not on his finger. With yells of delight, the goblins rushed upon him. A pang of fear and loss, like an echo of Gollum's misery, smote Bilbo, and forgetting even to draw his sword, he struck his hands into his pockets, and there was the ring still in his left pocket, and it slipped on his finger. The goblins stopped short. They could not see a sign of him. He had vanished. They yelled twice as loud as before, and not so delightedly. Where is it? they cried. Go back up the passage, some shouted. This way, some yelled. That way, others yelled. Look out for the door, bellowed the captain. Whistles blew, armor clashed, swords rattled, goblins cursed and swore, and ran hither and thither, falling over one another and getting very angry. There was a terrible outcry, to do and disturbance. Bilbo was dreadfully frightened, but he had the sense to understand what had happened and to sneak behind a big barrel which held drink for the goblin guards, and so get out of the way and avoid being bumped into, trampled to death, or caught by feel. I must get to the door! I must get to the door! he kept on saying to himself. But it was a long time before he ventured to try. And then it was like a horrible game of blind man's bluff. The place was full of goblins running about, and the poor little hobbit dodged this way and that, was knocked over by a goblin who could not make out what he had bumped into, scrambled away on all fours, slipped between the legs of the captain just in time, got up and ran for the door. It was still ajar, but a goblin had pushed it nearly to. Bilbo struggled, but he could not move it. He tried to squeeze through the crack. He squeezed and squeezed, and he stuck. It was awful. His buttons had got wedged on the edge of the door and the doorpost. He could see outside, into the open air. There were a few steps running down into a narrow valley between tall mountains. The sun came out from behind a cloud and shone bright on the outside of the door, but he could not get through. Suddenly, one of the goblins inside shouted, There is a shadow by the door! Something is outside! Bilbo's heart jumped into his mouth. He gave a terrific squirm. Buttons burst off in all directions. He was through with a torn coat and waistcoat, leaping down the steps like a goat, while bewildered goblins were still picking up his nice brass buttons on the doorstep. Of course, they soon came down after him, hooting and hallooing and hunting among the trees. But they don't like the sun. It makes their legs wobble and their heads giddy. They could not find Bilbo with the ring on, slipping in and out of the shadows of the trees, running quick and quiet and keeping out of the sun. So soon, they went back grumbling and cursing to guard the door. Bilbo had escaped. And we will pause there for 10 minutes or so, and we will read one more chapter.
Hello again. Um, we shall begin in the next minute or two. Um, but uh, I also did want to point out one thing that I forgot to mention at the beginning. Um, if anybody is here who didn't come last week or who managed to forget to buy a postcard and wanted to buy a postcard, I meant to bring last week's with me this week as well. So I actually do have some left from last week. Uh, so I will bring those next week along with any leftover from this week with the third one next week. So if you, if you do miss and you don't buy one, um, then I will keep bringing them. I just forgot this time. So don't worry, they'll still be available um, and that should all be fine. Um, but yes, so let's begin again in one minute. Okay, shall we begin again? Let us carry on with chapter six. Out of the frying pan into the fire. Bilbo had escaped the goblins, but he did not know where he was. He had lost hood, cloak, food, pony, his buttons, and his friends. He wandered on and on till the sun began to sink westwards behind the mountains. Their shadows fell across Bilbo's path, and he looked back. Then he looked forward and could see before him only ridges and slopes falling towards lowlands and plains glimpsed occasionally between the trees. Good heavens! he exclaimed, I seem to have got right to the other side of the Misty Mountains, right to the edge of the land beyond. Oh, where, oh, where can Gandalf and the dwarves have got to? Oh, I only hope to goodness they're not still back in there, in the power of the goblins. He still wandered on, out of the little high valley, over its edge and down the slopes beyond. And all the while, a very uncomfortable thought was growing inside him. He wandered whether he ought not, now he had the magic ring, to go back into the horrible, horrible tunnels and look for his friends. He had just made up his mind that it was his duty, that he must turn back, and very miserable he felt about it, when he heard voices. He stopped and listened. It did not sound like goblins, so he crept forward carefully. He was on a stony path, winding downwards with a rocky wall on the left hand. On the other side, the ground sloped away, and there were dells below the level of the path, overhung with bushes and low trees. In one of these dells, under the bushes, people were talking. He crept still nearer, and suddenly he saw, peering between two big boulders, a head with a red hood on. It was Barlin doing lookout. He could have clapped and shouted for joy, but he did not. He had still got the ring on, for fear of meeting something unexpected and unpleasant, and he saw that Balin was looking straight at him without noticing him. <laughs> I will give them all a surprise, he thought, as he crawled into the bushes at the edge of the dell. Gandalf was arguing with the dwarves. They were discussing all that had happened to them in the tunnels and wondering and debating what they were to do now. The dwarves were grumbling, 
and Gandalf was saying that they could not possibly go on without, with their journey, leaving Mr. Baggins in the hands of the goblins, without trying to find out if he was de dead or alive, and without trying to rescue him. After all, he is my friend, said the wizard, and not a bad little chap. I feel responsible for him. I wish to goodness you had not lost him. The dwarves wanted to know why he had ever been brought at all, why he could not stick to his friends and come along with them, and why the wizard had not chosen someone with more sense. He has been more trouble to us so, so far than use, said one. If we have got to go back now into those abominable tunnels to look for him, well then drat him, I say, Gandalf answered angrily. I brought him, and I don't bring things that are of no use. Either you help me to look for him, or I go and leave you here to get out of the mess as best as you can yourselves. If we can only find him again, you will thank me before it is all over. Whatever did you want to go and drop him for, Dorry? You would have dropped him, said Dorry, if a goblin had suddenly grabbed your legs from behind in the dark, tripped up your feet, and kicked you in the back. Well, then why didn't you pick him up again? Well, good heavens, can you ask? Goblins fighting and biting in the dark, everybody falling over bodies and hitting one another. You nearly chopped off me head with Glamdrin, and Thorin was stabbing here and there and everywhere with Ockrist. And all of a sudden, you give one of your blinding flashes, and we saw the goblins running back, yelping, and you shouted, follow me, everybody, and everybody ought to have followed. We thought everybody had. There was no time to count, as you know quite well, till we had dashed through the gate guards out of the lower door and helter-skelter down here. And here we are, without the burglar, confiscate him. And here's the burglar, said Bilbo, stepping down into the middle of them and slipping off the ring. Bless me, how they jumped. Then they shouted with surprise and delight. Gandalf was as astonished as any of them, but probably more pleased than all the others. He called to Balin and told him what he thought of a lookout man who let people walk right into them without warning. It is a fact that Bilbo's reputation went up a very great deal with the dwarves after this. If they had still doubted that he was really a first-class burglar in spite of Gandalf's words, they doubted no longer. Balin was the most puzzled of all, but everyone said it was a very clever bit of work. Indeed, Bilbo was so pleased with their praise that he just chuckled inside and said nothing whatever about the ring. And when they asked him how he did it, he said, Oh, uh, just crept along, you know, very carefully and quietly. Well, it's the first time that even a mouse has crept along carefully and quietly under my very nose and not been spotted, said Balin, and I take my hood off to you, which he did. Balin, at your service, said he. Your servant, Mr. Baggins, said Bilbo. And then they wanted to know all about his adventures after he, they had lost him. And he sat down and told them everything, except about the finding of the ring. Not just now, he thought. They were particularly interested in the riddle competition and shuddered most appreciatively at his description of Gollum. And then I couldn't think of any other question with him sitting beside me, ended Bilbo. So I said, what's in my pocket? And he couldn't guess in three goes. So I said, what about your promise? Show me the way out. But well, he came at me to kill me, and I ran over and fell over because he, well, then he missed me in the dark, and, and, and I followed him, and well, then I heard him talking to himself, and he thought I really knew the way out, and so he was making for it, and then he sat down by the entrance, and I couldn't get by, so I jumped over him and escaped and ran down to the gate. What about the guards? they asked. Weren't there any? Uh, oh, yes, um, lots of them, but I dodged them. Uh, I got stuck in the door, which was only open a crack, and I lost lots of buttons, he said, sadly looking at his torn clothes. Uh, but I squeezed through all right, and here I am. The dwarves looked at him with quite a new respect when he talked about dodging guards, jumping over Gollum, and squeezing through as if it was not very difficult or very alarming. Hey, what did I tell you? said Gandalf, laughing. Mr. Baggins has more about him than you guess. He gave Bilbo a queer look from under his bushy eyebrows as he said this, and the hobbit wondered if he guessed at the part of his tale that he had left out. Then he had questions of his own to ask, for if Gandalf had explained it now, but by now to the dwarves, Bilbo had not heard it. He wanted to know how the wizard had turned up again, and where they had all got to now. 
the wizard to tell the truth, never minded explaining his cleverness more than once. So now he told Bilbo that both he and Elrond had been well aware of the presence of evil goblins in that part of the mountains. But their main gate used to come out on a different pass, one more easy to travel, uh, so that they often caught people benighted near the gates. Evidently, people had given up going that way, and the goblins must have opened their new entrance at the top of the pass the dwarves had taken quite recently, because it had been found quite safe up to now. I must see if I can't find a more or less decent giant to block it up again, said Gandalf, or soon there will be no getting over the mountains at all. As soon as Gandalf had heard Bilbo's yell, he realized what had happened. In the flash which killed the goblins that were grabbing him as he nipped inside the crack, just as it snapped too, he followed after the drivers and prisoners right to the edge of the great hall, and there he sat down and worked up the best magic he could in the shadows. A very ticklish business it was, he said. Touch and go. But of course, Gandalf had made a special study of bewitchments with fire and lights. Even the Hobbit had never forgotten the magic fireworks at Old Took's Midsummer Eve parties, as you remember. The rest we all know, except that Gandalf knew all about the back door, as the goblins called the Lower Gate, where Bilbo lost his buttons. As a matter of fact, it was well known to anybody who was acquainted with this part of the mountains, but it took a wizard to keep his head in the tunnels and guide them in the right direction. And they made that gate ages ago, he said, partly for a way of escape if they needed one, partly as a way out into the lands beyond, where they still come in the dark and do great damage. They guard it always, and no one has ever managed to block it up. They were guarded doubly after this, he laughed. And the others laughed too. After all, they had lost a good deal, but they had killed the great goblin and a great many others besides, and they had all escaped. So they might be said to have had the best of it so far. But the wizard called them to their senses. We must be getting on at once now. We are a little rested, he said. They will be out after us in hundreds when night comes on, and already shadows are lengthening. They can smell our footsteps for hours and hours after we have passed. We must be miles on before dusk, and that will be a bit of moon, hopefully, if it keeps fine, and that is lucky. Not that they mind the moon much, but it will give us a little light to steer by. Oh, yes, he said in answer to more questions from the Hobbit. You lose track of time inside goblin tunnels. Today is Thursday. It was Monday night or Tuesday morning that we were captured. We have gone miles and miles and come right down through the heart of the mountains and are now on the other side in quite a shortcut. But we are not at the point to which our pass would have brought us. We are far too north and have some awkward country ahead. And we are still pretty high up. Let's get on. I I'm dreadfully hungry groaned Bilbo, who was suddenly aware that he had not had a meal since the night before the night before last. Just think of that for a hobbit. His stomach felt all empty and loose and his legs all wobbly now that the excitement was over. Can't help it, said Gandalf, unless you like to go back and ask the goblins nicely to let you have your pony back and your luggage. Uh, no, thank you, said Bilbo. Very well, then. We must just tighten our belts and trudge on, or we shall be made into supper and that will be much worse than having none ourselves. As they went on, Bilbo looked from side to side for something to eat, but the blackberries were still only in flower, and of course there were no nuts, not even hawthorn berries. He nibbled a bit of sorrel, and he drank from a small mountain stream that crossed the path, and he ate three wild strawberries that he found on its bank but it was not much good. They still went on and on. The rough path disappeared, the bushes and the long grasses between the boulders, the patches of rabbit-cropped turf, the thyme and the sage and the majorum and the yellow rock roses all vanished. And they found themselves at the top of a wide, steep slope of fallen stones, the remains of a landslide. When they began to go down this, rubbish and small pebbles rolled away from their feet. Soon, larger bits of split stone went clattering down and started other pieces below them slithering and rolling, and then lumps of rock were disturbed and bounded off, crashing down with a dust and a noise, 
Before long, the whole slope above them and below them seemed on the move, and they were sliding away, huddled all together, in a fearful confusion of slipping, rattling, cracking slabs and stones. It was the trees at the bottom that saved them. They slid into the edge of a climbing wood of pines that here stood right up the mountain slope from the deeper, darker forests of the valleys below. Some caught hold of the trunks and swung themselves into lower branches. Some, like the little hobbit, got behind a tree to shelter from the onslaught of rocks. Soon the danger was over. The slide had stopped, and the last faint crashes could be heard as the largest of the disturbed stones went bounding and spinning among the bracken and the pine roots far below. Well, that has got us on a bit, said Gandalf, and even goblins tracking us will have a job to come down here quietly. I dare say, grumbled Bombor, but they won't find it difficult to send stones bouncing down on our heads. The dwarves and Bilbo were feeling far from happy and were rubbing their bruised and damaged legs and feet. Nonsense, we are going to turn aside here, out of the path of the slide. We must be quick, look at the light. The sun had long gone behind the mountains. Already the shadows were deepening about them, though far away, through the trees and over the black tops of those growing lower down, they could still see the evening lights on the plains beyond. They limped along now, as fast as they were able, down the gentle slopes of a pine forest in a slanting path leading steadily southward. At times they were pushing through a sea of bracken with tall fronds rising right above the hobbit's head, at times they were marching along quiet as quiet over a floor of pine needles. And all the while, the forest gloom got heavier, and the forest silence deeper. There was no wind that evening to bring even a sea sighing into the branches of the trees. <laughs> Must we go on any further? asked Bilbo when it was so dark that he could only just see Thorin's beard wagging beside him, and so quiet he could hear the dwarves breathing like a loud noise. My toes are all bruised and bent, and my legs ache, and my stomach is wagging like an empty sack. A bit further, said Gandalf. After what seemed ages further, they came suddenly to an opening where no trees grew. The moon was up and was shining into the clearing. Somehow it struck all of them as not at all a nice place, although there was nothing wrong to see. All of a sudden, they heard a howl away downhill, a long, shuddering howl. It was answered by another away to the right and a good deal nearer to them, and then by another not far away to the left. It was the wolves howling at the moon, wolves gathering together. There were no wolves living near Mr. Baggins' hole at home, but he knew that noise. He had had it described to him often enough in tales. One of his elder cousins on the Took side, who had been a great traveller, used to imitate it, imitate it to frighten him. To hear it out in the forest under the moon was too much for Bilbo. Even magic rings are not much use against wolves, especially against the evil packs that lived under the shadow of the goblin-infested mountains, over the edge of the wild, on the borders of the unknown. Wolves of that sort smell keener than goblins, and do not need to see you to catch you. What shall we do? What shall we do? He cried. Escaping goblins to be caught by wolves, he said. And it became a proverb, though we now say, out of the frying pan into the fire, in the same sort of uncomfortable situation. Up the trees, quick, cried Gandalf, and they ran to the trees at the edge of the glade, hunting for those that had branches fairly low, or were slender enough to swarm up. They found them as quick as ever they could, you can guess, and up they went as high as ever they could trust the branches. You would have laughed from a safe distance if you had seen the dwarves sitting up in the trees with their beards dangling down, like old gentlemen gone cracked and playing at being boys. Feely and Keely were at the top of a tall larch like an enormous Christmas tree. Dory, Nori, Ori, Oyen, and Gloyen were more comfortable in a huge pine with regular branches sticking out at intervals like the spokes of a wheel. Biffa, Boffa, Bomba, and Thorin were in another. Dwalin and Balin had swarmed up a tall, slender fir with few branches and were trying to find a place to sit in the greenery of the topmost boughs. Gandalf, who was a good deal taller than the others, had found a tree into which they could not climb 
a large pine standing at the very edge of the glade. He was quite hidden in its boughs, but you could see his eyes gleaming in the moon as he peeped out. And Bilbo? He could not get into any tree. He was scuttling about from trunk to trunk like a rabbit that has lost its hole after, after, and has a dog after it. You've left the burglar behind again, said Nori to Dory, looking down. I can't always be carrying burglars on my back, said Dory. Down tunnels and up trees, what do you think I am, a porter? He'll be eaten if we don't do something, said Thorin, for there were howls all around them now, getting nearer and nearer. Dory, he called, for Dory was lowest down in the easiest tree. Be quick, give Mr Baggins a hand up. Dory was really a decent fellow in spite of his grumbling. Poor Bilbo could not reach his hand even when he climbed down to the bottom branch and hung his arm down as far as ever he could. So Dory actually climbed out of the tree and let Bilbo scramble up and stand on his back. Just at that moment, the wolves trotted howling into the clearing. All of a sudden, there were hundreds of eyes looking at them. Still, Dory did not let Bilbo down. He waited till he had clambered off his shoulders into the branches, and then he jumped for the branches himself, only just in time. A wolf snapped at his cloak as he swung up and nearly got him. In a minute, there was a whole pack of them yelping all round the tree and leaping up at the trunk, with eyes blazing and tongues hanging out. But even the wild wags, for so the evil wolves over the edge of the wild were named, cannot climb trees. For a time, they were safe. Luckily, it was warm and not windy. Trees are not very comfortable to sit in for long at any time, but in the cold and wind, with wolves all around, below, waiting for you, they can be perfectly miserable places. This glade in the Ring of Trees was evidently a meeting place of the wolves. More and more kept coming in. They left guards at the foot of the tree in which Dory and Bilbo were, and then went sniffing about until they had smelt out every tree that had anyone in it. And these they guarded too, while all the rest, hundreds and hundreds it seemed, went and sat in a great circle in the glade, and in the middle of the circle was a great grey wolf. He spoke to them in the dreadful language of the wags. Gandalf understood it, Bilbo did not, but it sounded terrible to him, and as if all their talk was about cruel and wicked things, as it was. Every now and then all the wags in the circle would answer their grey chief altogether, and their dreadful clamour almost made the hobbit fall out of his pine tree. I will tell you what Gandalf heard, though Bilbo did not understand it. The wags and the goblins often helped one another in wicked deeds. Goblins do not usually venture very far from the mountains unless they are driven out and are looking for new homes, or are marching to war, which I am glad to say has not happened for a long while. But in those days they sometimes used to go on raids, especially to get food or slaves to work for them. Then they often got the wags to help and shared the plunder with them. Sometimes they rode on wolves like men do on horses. Now it seemed that a great goblin raid had been planned for that very night. The wags had come to meet the goblins, and the goblins were late. The reason, no doubt, was the death of the great goblin, and all the excitement caused by the dwarves and Bilbo and the wizard, for whom they were probably still hunting. In spite of the dangers of this far land, bold men had of late been making their way back into it from the south cutting down trees and building themselves places to live in among the more pleasant woods in the valleys and along the river shores. There were many of them, and they were brave and well armed, and even the wags dared not attack them if there were many together, or in the bright day. But now they had planned, with the goblins' help, to come by night upon some of the villages nearest the mountains. If their plan had been carried out, there would have been none left there next day. All would have been killed except the few the goblins kept from the wolves and carried back as prisoners to their caves. This was dreadful talk to listen to, not only because of the brave woodmen and their wives and children, but also because of the danger which now threatened Gandalf and his friends. The wags were angry and puzzled at finding them here in their very meeting place. They thought they were friends of the woodmen and were come to spy on them and would take news of their plans down into the valleys, and then the goblins and the wolves would have to fight a terrible battle instead of capturing prisoners and devouring people waked suddenly from their sleep. So the wags had no intention of going away and letting the people up the trees escape, at any rate not until morning. And long before that, they said, goblin soldiers would be coming down from the mountains, and goblins can climb trees, or cut them down. 
Now you can understand why Gandalf, listening to their growling and yelping, began to be dreadfully afraid, wizard though he was, and to feel that they were in a very bad place and had not yet escaped at all. All the same, he was not going to let them have it all their own way, though he could not do very much, stuck up in a tree with wolves all around on the ground below. He gathered the huge pine cones from the branches of the tree, then he set one alight with a bright blue fire and threw it whizzing down among the circle of the wolves. It struck one on the back, and immediately his shaggy coat caught fire, and he was leaping to and fro, yelping horribly. Then another came, and another, one in blue flames, one in red, another in green. They burst on the ground in the middle of the circle and went off in coloured sparks and smoke. A specially large one hit the chief wolf on the nose, and he leapt in the air ten feet and then rushed round and round the circle, biting and snapping even at the other wolves in his anger and fright. The dwarves and Bilbo shouted and cheered. The rage of the wolves was terrible to see, and the commotion they made filled all the forest. Wolves are afraid of fire at all times, but this was a most horrible and uncanny fire. If a spark got in their coats, it stuck and burned into them, and unless they rolled over quick, they were soon all in flames. Very soon, all about the glade, wolves were rolling over and over to put out the sparks on their backs, while those that were burning were running around howling and setting others alight, till their own friends chased them away and they fled off down the slopes, crying and yammering and looking for water. What is all this uproar in the forest tonight? said the Lord of the Eagles. He was sitting, black in the moonlight, on the top of a lonely pinnacle of rock at the eastern edge of the mountains. I hear wolves' voices. Are the goblins at mischief in the woods? He swept up into the air, and immediately two of his guards from the rocks at either hand leapt up to follow him. They circled in the sky and looked down upon the ring of the wags, a tiny spot far, far below. But eagles have keen eyes and can see small things at a great distance. The Lord of the Eagles of the Misty Mountains had eyes that could look at the sun unblinking and could see a rabbit moving on the ground a mile below, even in the moonlight. So though he could not see the people in the trees, he could make out the commotion among the wolves and see the tiny flashes of fire and hear the howling and yelping come up faint from far beneath him. Also, he could see the glint of the moon on goblin spears and helmets as long lines of the wicked folk crept down the hillsides from their gate and wound into the wood. Eagles are not kindly birds. Some are cowardly and cruel. But the ancient race of the northern mountains were the greatest of all birds. They were proud and strong and noble-hearted. They did not love goblins or fear them. When they took any notice of them at all, which was seldom, for they did not eat such creatures, they swooped on them and drove them shrieking back to their caves and stopped whatever wickedness they were doing. The goblins hated the eagles and feared them, but could not reach their lofty seats or drive them from the mountains. Tonight, the Lord of the Eagles was filled with curiosity to know what was afoot. So he summoned many other eagles to him, and they flew away from the mountains. And slowly circling ever round and round, they came down, 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 towards the ring of the wolves and the meeting place of the goblins. A very good thing, too. Dreadful things had been going on down there. The wolves that had caught fire and fled into the forest had set it alight in several places. It was high summer and on this eastern side of the mountains there had been little rain for some time. Yellowing bracken, fallen branches, deep-piled pine needles, and here and there dead trees were soon in flames. All round the clearing of the wags, fire was leaping. But the wolf guards did not leave the trees. Maddened and angry, they were leaping and howling round the trunks and cursing the dwarves in their horrible language, with their tongues hanging out and their eyes shining as red and fierce as the flames. Then suddenly goblins came running up, yelling. They thought a battle with the woodmen was going on, but they soon learned what had really happened. Some of them actually sat down and laughed. Others waved their spears and clashed the shafts against their shields. Goblins are not afraid of fire, and they soon had a plan which seemed to them most amusing. Some got all the wolves together in a pack. Some stacked fern and brushwood around the tree trunks. Others rushed round and stamped and beat and beat and stamped until nearly all the flames were put out. 
but they did not put out the fire nearest to the trees where the dwarves were. That fire they fed with leaves and dead branches and bracken. Soon they had a ring of smoke and flame all round the dwarves, a ring which they kept from spreading outwards, but it closed slowly in, till the running fire was licking the fuel piled under the trees. Smoke was in Bilbo's eyes. He could feel the heat of the flames, and through the reek he could see the goblins dancing round and round in a circle like people round a midsummer bonfire. Outside the ring of dancing warriors with spears and axes stood the wolves at a respectful distance, watching and waiting. He could hear the goblins beginning a horrible song. Fifteen birds in five fir trees, their feathers were fanned in a fiery breeze. But what funny little birds, they had no wings. Oh, what shall we do with the funny little things? Roast them alive or stew them in a pot. Fry them, boil them and eat them hot. Then they stopped and shouted out, Fly away, little birds, fly away if you can. Come down, little birds, or you will get roasted in your nests. Sing, sing, little birds, why don't you sing? Go away, little boys, shouted Gandalf in answer. It isn't bird nesting time. Also, naughty little boys that play with fire get punished. He said it to make them angry and to show them that he was not frightened of them, though, of course, he was wizard though he was. But they took no notice, and they went on singing. Burn, burn, tree and fern, shrivel and scorch a fizzling torch, to light the night for our delight. Yahay! Bake and toast them, fry and roast them, till beards blaze and eyes glaze, till hair smells and skins crack, fat melts and bones black, in cinders lie beneath the sky, so dwarves shall die, and light the night for our delight. Ya hey, ya harry hey, ya hoy! And with that ya hoy, the flames were under Gandalf's tree. In a moment it spread to the others. The bark caught fire, the lower branches cracked. Then Gandalf climbed to the top of his tree. The sudden splendor flashed from his wand like lightning as he got ready to spring down from on high right among the spears of the goblins. That would have been the end of him, though he would probably have killed many of them as he came hurtling down like a thunderbolt, but he never leapt. Just at that moment, the Lord of the Eagles swept down from above, seized him in his talons, and he was gone. There was a howl of anger and surprise from the goblins. Loud cried the Lord of the Eagles, to whom Gandalf had now spoken. Back swept the great birds that were with him, and down they came like huge black shadows. The wolves yammered and gnashed their teeth. The goblins yelled and stamped with rage and flung their heavy spears in the air in vain. Over them swooped the eagles. The dark rush of their beating wings smote them to the floor or drove them far away. Their talons tore at goblin faces. Other birds flew to the treetops and seized the dwarves, who were scrambling up now as far as they ever dared to go. Poor little Bilbo was very nearly left behind again. He just managed to catch hold of Dory's legs as Dory was borne off last of all, and up they went together, above the tumult and the burning, Bilbo swinging in the air with his arms nearly breaking. Now far below, the goblins and the wolves were scattering far and wide in the woods, a few eagles were still circling and sweeping above the battleground. The flames about the trees sprang suddenly up above the highest branches. They went up in crackling fire. There was a sudden flurry of sparks and smoke. Bilbo had escaped only just in time. Soon the light of the burning was faint below, a red twinkle on the black floor. They were high up in the sky, rising all the time in strong, sweeping circles. Bilbo never forgot that flight, clinging onto Dory's ankles. He moaned, my arms, my arms. But Dory groaned, my poor legs, my poor legs. At the best of times, heights made Bilbo giddy. He used to turn queer if ever he looked over the edge of a quite a little cliff. And he had never liked ladders, let alone trees, never having had to escape from wolves before. So you can imagine how his head swam now when he looked down between his dangling toes and saw the dark lands opening wide underneath him, touched here and there with the light of the moon on a hillside rock or a stream in the plains. The pale peaks of the mountains were coming nearer, moonlit spikes of rock sticking out of black shadows. Summer or not, it seemed very cold. He shut his eyes and wondered if he could hold on any longer. 
Then he imagined what would happen if he did not. He felt sick. The flight ended only just in time for him, just before his arms gave way. He loosened Dory's ankles with a gasp and fell onto the rough platform of an eagle's eyrie. There he lay without speaking, and his thoughts were a mixture of surprise at being saved from the fire and fear lest he fall off that narrow place into the deep shadows on either side. He was feeling very queer indeed in his head by this time, after the dreadful adventures of the last three days with next to nothing to eat, and he found himself saying aloud, now I know what a piece of bacon feels like when it is suddenly picked out of a pan on a fork and put back on the shelf. No, you don't, he heard Dory answering, because the bacon knows that it will get back in the pan sooner or later, and it is to be hoped that we shan't. Also, eagles aren't forks. Uh, 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 no, not a bit like storks. Uh, forks, uh, I mean, said Bilbo, sitting up and looking anxiously at the eagle who was perched close by. He wondered what other nonsense he had been saying, and if the eagle would think it rude. You ought not to be rude to an eagle when you are only the size of a hobbit, and are right up in his eyrie at night. The eagle only sharpened his beak on a stone, and trimmed his feathers, and took no notice. Soon another eagle flew up. The Lord of the Eagles bids you to bring your prisoners to the great shelf, he cried, and was off again. The other seized Dory in his claws, and flew away with him into the night leaving Bilbo all alone. He had just strength to wonder what the messenger had meant by prisoners, and to begin to think of being torn up for supper like a rabbit, when his own turn came. The eagle came back, seized him in his talons by the back of his coat, and swooped off. This time he flew only a short way. Very soon Bilbo was laid down, trembling with fear, on a wide shelf of rock on the mountainside. There was no path down onto it save by flying, and no path down off it except by jumping over a precipice. There he found all the others, sitting with their backs to the mountain wall. The Lord of the Eagles was also there, and was speaking to Gandalf. It seemed that Bilbo was not going to be eaten after all. The wizard and the eagle lord appeared to know one another, slightly, and even to be on friendly terms. As a matter of fact, Gandalf, who had often been in the mountains, had once rendered a service to the eagles, and healed their lord from an arrow wound. So you see, prisoners had meant prisoners rescued from the goblins only, and not captives of the eagles. As Bilbo listened to the talk of Gandalf, he realized that at last they were going to escape, really and truly, from the dreadful mountains. He was discussing plans with the great eagle for carrying the dwarves and himself and Bilbo far away and setting them down well on their journey across the plains below. The Lord of the Eagles would not take them anywhere near where men lived. They would shoot at us with their great bows of you, he said. They would think we were after their sheep, and at other times they would be right. No, we are glad to cheat the goblins of their sport, and glad to repay our thanks to you. But we will not risk ourselves for dwarves in the southward plains. Very well, said Gandalf. Take us where and as far as you will. We are already deeply obliged to you, but in the meantime, we are famished with hunger. I, I, I'm nearly dead of it, said Bilbo, in a weak little voice that nobody heard. Well, that perhaps can be mended, said the Lord of the Eagles. Later on, you might have seen a bright fire on the shelf of rock and the figures of the dwarves round it, cooking and making a fine roasting smell. The eagles had brought up dry boughs for fuel, and they had brought rabbits, hares, and a small sheep. The dwarves managed all the preparations. Bilbo was too weak to help, and anyway, he was not much good at skinning rabbits or cutting up meat, being used to having it delivered by the butcher, all ready to cook. Gandalf, too, was lying down, after doing his part in setting the fire going, since Oyen and Gloyen had lost their tinder boxes. Dwarves have never taken to matches, even yet. So ended the adventures of the Misty Mountains, Soon Bilbo's stomach was feeling full and comfortable again, and he felt he could sleep contentedly, though really he would have liked a loaf and butter better than bits of meat toasted on sticks. He slept curled up on the hard rock, more soundly than ever he had done on his feather bed in his own little hole at home. But all night he dreamed of his own house, and wandered in his sleep into all his different rooms, looking for something that he could not find nor remember what it looked like.
And we'll finish there for tonight. Thank you all very much for coming. And uh, maybe see you next week. And uh, have a safe travel home. Thank you very much.